Um, just a quick announcement. Uh, we've had about, what, 200 and some odd, 250 of these books donated to us. Um, it's called The Little Lamb, The Little Lamb's First Christmas. Uh, the woman who donated them asked only that they be given to kids that can't, wouldn't normally be able to afford them. So if you know of any children in your neighborhood, in your family, um, and you'd like one of these books, see Al. Al, just raise your hand. That's Al right there. What do you think, Al? Okay. Yeah. So we have some to give out, and we'll also give them out at the outreach. So anybody want any, just see Al after service. Well, the good-looking one. Another announcement, because it wouldn't be Calvary Chapel without announcements on top of announcements. You know, I always say that. Coming up this new year, on January 4th, we're going to be doing something a little bit different here. Now, you know, right now, every other Wednesday is Judges, and then the Wednesdays in between is Convergence of Prophecy. That has gotten a little confusing, um, and so I don't want to stop teaching the Word on Wednesday nights, but we want to keep it prophecy-centered. So beginning January 4th, every Wednesday, we will be teaching through the prophetic books, beginning in Isaiah. And we should be in the prophetic books until Jesus comes back, I pray. Right after that, we will be in, it will be a convergence of prophecy every Wednesday night. And so we'll change the times a little bit. Dinner now will be from 5.30 to 6.15. And these are posted on the bulletin board and all around. Um, 6.15 to 7 p.m. will be Isaiah. We're starting with Isaiah. And then 7 to 7.45 will be convergence of prophecy. And then we'll have our discussion right after that. So if you like prophecy, then you're going to love Wednesdays. The other thing that's new beginning Wednesday, January 4th, is we're going to have a teen young adult ministry. And that ministry is going to focus on the gospel message and what that means today and, and the troubles and this, the challenges that our young adults and our teens face in this world and how to navigate them according to the Bible. It's going to be a safe place for them to meet, for them to talk about what they're facing and to be able to talk about that without any backlash or any, any issues. So if you're interested in that, see John. He's right there. There you go. And pray for John because he's just finding out tonight that it starts on January 4th. <laughs> so if you would, open your Bibles to Luke chapter 20. Chapter 20, beginning in verse 27. If you need a Bible, just slip up your hand, we'll get you a Bible. So Luke chapter 20, verse 27. There came to him Sadducees, those who deny that there is a resurrection. So Lord, we just lift this study up to you this morning. I thank you for all those who have come out, even though there's a threat of bad weather in the air. Lord, I thank you for the faithful and those who are here, Lord, those who are sitting at your feet, and I pray, Lord, that your word would do exactly as you intended to do this morning. So go before us. We ask it in your name. Amen. Amen. So the Sadducees are a sect, if you will, of the religious leaders. Sadducees were an aristocratic class of people connected to everything that went on in and around the temple. Now, they tended to be very wealthy. So they held powerful positions within the religious community, including the chief priest, the, the high priest, and they held the majority of the 70 seats in the Sanhedrin. Now, they acknowledged the entire Old Testament, but they ascribed only, the only authority they ascribed was to the Pentateuch, to the five books of Moses. They're very liberal in their beliefs, and there are some important doctrines that they actually denied. Doctrines like they denied God's involvement in everyday life. They denied the resurrection of the dead. They denied in the, the afterlife that there was anything um, that happened past this life, so therefore there was no penalty or reward when you left this life. They denied the existence of a spiritual world. They denied the existence of angels and demons. So they had some pretty serious disbeliefs. 
Now, the interaction Jesus has with them here is the last public appeal that Jesus would make to the religious sect. He would, this would be the last challenge to them to look at the evidence. Look at what's go- happened. Look at what's going to happen and believe, believe to see that he was indeed the Messiah. Now, Jesus could have just written them off as unbelievers, but in his heart, in his heart, Jesus' heart, God's heart is that none should perish, right? But all should be saved, all. And so as we look at his interaction with them, especially verses 40 through 47, which we're not going to get to this morning, we're going to see that he shows them that he is, in fact, the Messiah. But even after all this overwhelming evidence, they still refuse to see the truth. Isn't that true for so many today? So many of our family members. You know, we always say, how can we see Jesus as Lord so plainly, but the people we love fail to see it the way we see it? The greatest danger to what they believed or didn't believe, of course, is that there's no resurrection. And that's why they were sad, you see. That, old, that joke is old, and it's as dumb now as it was when they first told it. John wrote in his first letter, Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. In the context of the chapter that John writes this in, he's speaking of the resurrection. That those who have placed their hope in the resurrection... It changes the way we live, or at least it should change the way we live. We should seek to live a holy and pure life because, listen, we are only a heartbeat away from standing before the Lord. All of us are a heartbeat away from eternity. And so knowing that, it should change the way we live this life. Knowing that we will be resurrected. And that when we do, when we do take our last breath on this earth, we will see him face to face. We will be resurrected. That, in and of itself, should give us hope, no? But if you have no hope in a life beyond this life, then listen, it's easy to understand why you would think it's eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow I may die. And when you live like that, when you have no faith in life beyond this life, then your goal would be to live your best life now, wouldn't it? To live life to its fullest while you're here. But for those who have faith in the promise of life after this one, after this one ends, life with eternity eternity with Jesus, for those who have faith in that, we can look forward to an eternity beyond this life. Thank God for that. An eternity, a life with Christ that that's greater than we could ever imagine or think of our own. The beauty and the joy of that time that eternity with jesus and and eternity is hard to think of isn't it i remember as a young kid just laying out in a on the grass because i was a weird kid and just laying there and looking up at the sky and thinking about eternity i mean can you imagine never ending never ending never ending that's what we have to look forward to You have to understand as we go through this text this morning that this happens between two resurrections. Two resurrections for a group of religious people who don't believe in the resurrection, right? The first one was Lazarus, which had occurred just days before Jesus has this interaction with the Sadducees. Now, I'm sure that the Sadducees had spin doctors, and they put a spin on it, and I'm sure they told the story that Lazarus was only sleeping when Jesus called him out of the tomb. But listen... Jesus waited until Lazarus was good and dead. When Jesus commanded that the stone be rolled away, Martha said, Lord, by this time there will be an odor. You think? He's been dead for four days. No refrigeration. He smells in the hot desert sun. Lazarus wasn't sleeping. Lazarus was dead. And so to the Sadducees, this created a problem, didn't it? But this is how they thought of handling it. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priest made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. That's their plan. That's their plan. Let's just put him to death. Since Jesus raised him from the dead, 
Let's reverse that. We'll put him to death. Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. So listen, it seems that the Sadducees were more than just a sect of religious leaders. They were the Jewish mafia. I mean, they're going to send Uncle Vito to take Lazarus on a one-way ride in the, in the Lincoln, right? So, sorry for those of you who are Italian in here, but... You know what? We really don't know if they put that plan into effect after Jesus was crucified, do we? They may very well may have killed Lazarus after Jesus was crucified. We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us what happened to Lazarus, but we do know that Lazarus would once again experience death in this life and that he would be resurrected into eternal life with our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a promise we all have who are believers. The other resurrection that they would have to deal with would be Jesus' resurrection just a few days after this interaction. When the Roman guards went to the chief priest, the Sadducees, to tell them that Jesus had just upped and walked out of that tomb. What was their story? Well, we're not going to tell anybody that Jesus resurrected from the dead because that's a problem for us. We're just going to tell everybody that his body was stolen. Even though there was tons of physical evidence to his resurrection. Not only did Jesus raise from the dead that day, but the Bible tells us that many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep, meaning who were dead, were raised. And coming out of the tombs after, his re after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city, Jerusalem, and appeared to many. Matthew chapter 27, verses 52 through 53. So here you are, going about your business, you're buying bread in Jerusalem, and there's Uncle Mordecai who died 20 years ago. Just walking by. Can you imagine that? That's a real problem for the Sadducees, isn't it? Not only did one man raise from the grave, but all of these other bodies just raised up and walked around Jerusalem. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, that there were 500 witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. So the story that they stole his body doesn't hold water, does it? And even with all of this evidence of the resurrection, they refused to see with their heart what was clearly in front of their eyes. By denying the resurrection of the dead, they were missing what the resurrection means to the living. It means hope. It means hope. It means hope and so much more. If you're taking notes, the resurrection means we're justified. He was delivered over to death. For our sins, it was raised to life for our justification, Romans 4.25. Jesus died. He rose again, not for himself, but for you and for me. Because by his resurrection, all believers in Jesus Christ are justified, meaning that we're put right with God, or as I like, the, ver the, the definition I like, just as if you never did it. That's what justification means. According to the scripture, all of us are objects of wrath. Because we've broken God's law. We, we are rebellious and we deserve death. That's what the Bible tells us. But God laid our punishment on the cross. And Jesus took the wrath of God for us. So we could be justified before him. So the resurrection proves that God accepted Jesus' sacrifice for our sin. Second, the resurrection defeated death. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, we cannot die, he cannot die again Death no longer has mastery over him, Romans 6, verse 9. So we know from Scripture that death is the just punishment for sin. But Jesus rose from the dead, and because of his resurrection, it shows us that death could not hold him. Therefore, you and I should never fear death, because it cannot hold us either. Because if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, death has lost its sting. Amen? Third, the resurrection means union with Jesus. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also live with, in faith with him, Romans 6, 8. So by our faith, you and I receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ because we are united to him. And that means that when God looks at us, he no longer sees our unrighteousness, but he sees the righteousness of Christ upon us. Four, the resurrection gives us hope. In his great mercy has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, 1 Peter 1, verse 3. So believers in Jesus have this great hope. It's not a false hope. It's not well wishes. Rather, it is a hope based on our faith. 
we have been justified with we have been justified before God we're no longer his enemies we're no longer an enemy we're in enmity with God we are now heirs to the kingdom of heaven Paul wrote to the believers in Colossae since then you've been raised with Christ set your hearts on the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God Set your minds on the things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. 5. The resurrection means that we will be raised also. For as Adam will die, so in Christ will all be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15, 21. So Jesus is described in the Bible as the first fruits of the resurrection. And that affirms that since he rose from the dead, that there will be a future harvest. And you and I are that harvest. Because he lives, we will live. Now believers will enjoy a resurrected life and, what I'm especially looking forward to, a resurrected body. Where these knees will work will be raised in power. So it is with the resurrection of the dead, Paul tells us. What is sown in perishable is raised in imperishable. What is sown in dishonor is raised in glory. What is sown in weakness is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. 1 Corinthians 15, 42. Listen, the resurrection means that this shell, this tent that we occupy this body that's breaking down perishing daily and if you're young here that's what you have to look forward to this body that suffers in this life with all this pain and illness but that resurrection body it's free from all of those things we no longer suffer there will be no more sickness no more death no more pain no more tears for the believer. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he may die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Our hope is in this life, our hope, our only hope, our only sure hope, the only hope that's an anchor for our soul is in our resurrection. And for some on this earth, that means you may never experience death. There's some in here with us this morning that may never experience death because that hope includes one of the greatest promises we have in the Bible concerning believers. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That's our blessed hope. The hope that allows us to keep going, doesn't it? It helps us to endure the trials. It helps us to get through and endure the tribulations. But not everyone sadly has that hope. And the Sadducees were among them. Daniel wrote, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting contempt. Daniel 12 verse 2. Those who do not believe in Jesus, do not call him Lord and Savior, will also be resurrected one day, whether you believe in the resurrection or not. You'll be raised to everlasting contempt and punishment. That's why I believe Jesus made this one last attempt before the cross to show them, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, all of them who didn't believe, that he, in fact, indeed was the Messiah. Because he is there, he is our only hope. Because he knew that if they didn't believe that, and they died in that disbelief, that they would be separated from him for all eternity. And that broke the heart of our Lord. You know, dear brother in the Lord said after Wednesday night's convergence of prophecy, and that could get a little heavy. When you see what's going on in the world and how it relates to Bible prophecy, and it gets a little heavy sometimes. It really does. And he's, he always, he's asked this question before, but it's a great question. What can we do about this? You know, as bleak as the events around us seem to be, there is always something we can do as believers, and that first and foremost is pray. Not just pray, but humble ourselves. You know, God seemed to have found it necessary to, to tell us to humble ourselves and pray. 
Because it's the hardest thing that we, could, we do as Christians, isn't it? Just humble ourselves and pray. There's humility in the fact that you pray in the first place. Because you're saying to God, I can't do this on my own. I need your help. That's humility. The next thing we could do is do not despair. And remember that we have a hope within us. And that hope is our resurrection. No matter what happens to us in this world, we know that we will spend eternity with God in heaven. You know, Oliver was debating with me yesterday when we, I had him at Sky Zone whether he should get in a dodgeball game or not because the kids were all bigger than him. And so I said to him, what's the worst thing that could happen? You get pegged in the face with a rubber ball. Now, he didn't buy into my pep talk, so he didn't go in. But listen, as believers, what's the worst thing that can happen in this life? You face death. But because of the resurrection, death can't peg us in the face because Jesus took the sting out of death. Amen? So we are, as the scripture tells us, to give others that same hope that resides inside each one of us. And that hope is in the resurrection. Look at verses 28 through 33, if you would, please. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife but no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died without children, and the second and the third took her, and likewise all seven left no children and died. Afterward, the wom afterward rather, the woman also died in the resurrection, Therefore, whose wife will a woman be? For the seven had her as a wife. My first question, if I was there, would be, what was wrong with the second brother? Especially the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth brother. I mean, after you lost all those other ones, wouldn't you kind of stay away from her? You know, they didn't just make this story up. This was a real scenario in Jewish custom, and it was a law of Moses. They exaggerated the situation, a lot, but they didn't make it up. And what they're referring to here is what's called the Leverite marriage. And that word Leverite literally means marriage of a brother-in-law. Now, it has nothing to do with the tribe of Levi. It means a husband's brother. So a Leverite marriage you can find in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 through 6. God called it the duty of a brother-in-law to marry his sister-in-law so that and here's the reason for it, the purpose of this leave right marriage. And the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel, Deuteronomy 25, 6. So the purpose of this practice was that the brother's inheritance would be protected, especially his inheritance of the land. And the Sadducees would use this to show the example of how ridiculous the thought of resurrection would be. Because in this situation that they presented with seven brothers, who would be, who, how could you possibly figure this all out in the resurrection? Whose wife would she be? How would you ever be able to straighten this out? And so they used this to prove that the resurrection was false, that it was just a ridiculous notion. And Jesus is going to use their question, and he's going to show that they know nothing of the afterlife, nothing of the resurrection, not to humiliate them, but to plant a seed. Just plant that seed that maybe, just maybe, you're wrong about your thoughts or your disbelief of the resurrection. Look at verses 34 through 36. And Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. For they cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. So Jesus uses their question to teach them a, to teach them about the resurrection. And he's telling them that there's a different order of things. And he does that by showing them that they're, they're speaking of two separate realities. The current reality, and then the reality that is to come. In this life, in the current reality, there is an institution called marriage. And by the way, that institution is between a man and a woman. Now, man may think that he can redefine marriage, but it is and always will be 
created between man and woman. Now, the very first marriage was between Adam and Eve that God created. Guess what? A man and a woman. And you can't say that enough today, can you? The Sadducees are using this example of the Levite marriage to show, as I said, how ridiculous the resurrection was. But Jesus explains to them that the re resurrection, which is the reality to come, he's saying life doesn't just continue on as it does here on this earth. There is going to be a difference in the resurrection. And one of those differences is that the resurrected will no longer die. And that's the whole meaning behind resurrection in the first place, isn't it? Those who have closed their eyes for the last time on this earth will be raised from the dead alive, never to die again. Death and burial are part of this life, our current reality, but it is not part of the resurrected life. So since there's no death after resurrection, then the law of the leave right marriage doesn't apply because, number one, there's no death, and number two, there's no marriage in heaven. Now Jesus tells them, that in the resurrection, we are equal or like angels. And please take note of that. We are like angels. We don't become angels when we go to heaven. Uncle Vito's not up above. He's not your guardian angel looking down over you, taking care of you. We are like angels. And the fact that we do not die and we do not marry. Now, you may be married over 40 years here on this earth, but you will not be married in heaven. Now, for some, that may be good news. For a lot of married men, just know that your wife will no longer be able to tell you to pick your socks up. Now, you're going to know your spouse in heaven. You're going to know your family members. You're going to know your friends in heaven. Some of us, may be, it may be difficult to recognize us with hair. But we're going to know each other. That's what Paul tells us. We're going to know each other. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John knew it was who? <coughs> Moses and Elijah. How'd they know that? Were they wearing name tags? No, I don't think they were wearing name tags. I think supernaturally they knew it was, they had never met Moses and Elijah, but supernaturally they knew it was Moses and Elijah. Matthew records that Jesus added the following response to what we read here in Luke. But Jesus answered them, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. Matthew 22, verse 29. This really gets to the root of the Sadducees' problem. They didn't know the whole counsel of God because they only focused on the parts of the Bible that fit them, that fit their lifestyle. Does that sound familiar today? Pharisees, on the other hand, knew the word of God, but failed to apply it to their lives. Does that sound familiar today? Neither one of them really understood the power of God, which is always a result of not knowing the word of God or failing to apply it to your lives. We are experiencing the power of the word of God right here because this word written over 2,000 years ago still speaks to us today, doesn't it? It's still relevant to us today. They miss that. They miss that the supernatural power of God can do exceedingly abundantly above what we could think or imagine through his word. Through the word we're reading right now, we realize that there are still Sadducees and Pharisees among us today, aren't there? Those who do not believe. There are people who don't believe in the resurrection. There are people that believe today that you die and you're buried and that's it. It's over. There are people who believe that Jesus is not Lord. They don't believe in the Lordship of Jesus or that Jesus is the Son of God. There's those who believe that you could be saved without repenting, that there is no need for repentance. And they teach others this same garbage. I'm sorry. But it is. There are those today among us who know the Word of God but fail to apply it to their lives. There are Pharisees and Sadducees among us today, and they too do not know the power of the word of God in their lives. How sad is that? Look at verses, finish up with verse 37 through 40. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now he is not God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. 
Then some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well, for they no longer dared to ask him any questions. So the teachings of Jesus once again silence the religious leaders. And they don't know what to make of this. They don't know what to make of him. they got to go home and, and chew on this for a while because he just kind of put them in their place, didn't he? God said through Moses at the burning bush, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, Exodus chapter 3, verse 6. Remember, words matter, don't they? And please take note that God did not say, I was the God of your fathers. God says, I am the God of your fathers. Current, right? Present tense. When God said to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, Abraham had been dead 330 years already. When God said to Moses, I am the God of Isaac, Isaac had been dead 225 years. And when God said to Moses, I am the God of Jacob, Jacob had been dead for 198 years. Spurgeon wrote, a living God is the God of living men, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still alive. They were still alive as God spoke to Moses at the burning bush that day. And Jesus, speaking to the Jewish people, said, Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. John 8, verse 56. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, and this really set him off, I am. Jesus existed before Abraham was even formed in the womb. But Jesus also knew Abraham because he had spoken to him at the Oak of Mamre in Genesis chapter 18. Jesus knew Abraham in heaven with him because, as Jesus said, I am, meaning he is God. In the book of Job, we read when God, at the end of the book, we read that God restored all that Job had lost, right? And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 female donkeys. And he, even had seven, and he also had seven sons and three daughters. So God restored all that Job had lost twofold except his children. Job had ten children that he lost when the building collapsed on him. So to restore that twofold, God should have given him 20 children, right? He still had 20 children because the ten he lost were still alive in heaven, waiting to be reunited with their family. And the point of all of this is that God is the God of the living, not of the dead. Proving, Jesus hoped, the resurrection to the Sadducees. You know, in this life, we experience loss. But that loss prepares us for a life when there will be no more loss, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more sickness, no more COVID, no more death, no more plagues that they think of. No more. I have to rail myself in. A life we can only experience when we're raised to life in Christ Jesus. A life that can only be realized by surrendering your life to Jesus and submitting your will to him. Now Jesus said in verses 35 and 36, if you want to look back there, those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and the resurrection from the dead, they are God's children since they are children of the resurrection. Those who will be with Jesus in the resurrection are those who are called God's children. And how do you know if you're God's child? Jesus answers that question for us in John chapter 1, verse 12. But all those who receive him, who believed in his name, to them he gave the right to be called children of God. To become a child of God means that you must believe in Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. Right? Remember from last week, we're, call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. The key is is Jesus now becomes your Lord. Do you believe that? And if you do not, it is as easy as ABC. A, admit you're a sinner. You've fallen short of the glory of God. 
As the Bible tells us, there's none righteous, no, not one. And that's where the gospel begins. It begins with our recognition of our sin and our need for a Savior. John would write, right, if you consider yourself not a sinner, and there's so many today that consider themselves not a sinner, why should I repent? I have nothing to repent of, was the words of a now infamous man, once famous. But John says, if you say you are not a sinner, you're a liar. And a holy and righteous God cannot look upon sin. Paul wrote, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So first and foremost, the condition of sin must be dealt with in our lives. And that's why repentance is so important. It is a change of our view of sin and what it does not only to the people around us, to us, but what it does more importantly to God our Father. And there must be a change, as we went over last week, a feeling, a sorrow over our sin, a sorrow that leads to repentance. And then there must be a change of direction to turn from our sin and turn to Jesus. And that brings us to B. Believe with your heart. Believe with all your heart that Jesus is Lord, that God raised him from the dead, and that he will soon come back for his church, and then he'll be back to judge the living and the dead. Romans 10 and 11 says, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, Whoever believes on him would not be put to shame. Anyone here regret giving their heart to Jesus? Ever? Anybody want to go back? Never. We must believe, we must have faith that Jesus is Messiah, that he alone is Savior, that there's nothing that we could possibly ever do to save ourselves. And without Jesus, we face the judgment of God for our sins. So we see, call upon Jesus for our salvation. Because without Jesus as Savior, we remain dead in our trespasses and sin. And the only way to be made alive is by the grace of God, through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, and our faith in that sacrifice. This is the only way to be saved. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. So if you're ready to die to self, if you're ready to turn from your sin and allow Jesus or ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will what? Be saved. The key here, again, and I'm going to say it ad nauseum, the Lord Jesus Make sure he's the Lord of your life, not you. Jesus is calling you, me, all of us, to get off the throne. There's not room on there for both of us, especially when you're my size. The call upon the name of the Lord means to call him Lord and Savior. He is your Adonai. He is your Christ. So call upon his name. Surrender your will to him, and you will be saved. Amen? Please stand. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your word. And Lord, we are blessed, blessed to call you Lord and Savior. We are blessed in the knowledge of our hope that we will one day live with you in all eternity. Thank you for that hope that we have in this ever-growing dark world. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now.